Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, that sort of worked. I don't know why you're on top of the overlay now. That's not supposed to happen. Oh, that's why. I figured it out. Beautiful. Hi, Rifkin! Is this Rifkin here? He might have be right back. Yeah, sorry, I smelled soup, so I had to go clean it ah. up. Hello! Hey. Um, yeah, he doesn't have a camera today, but you can just see that beautiful mug shot. He's actually still here. Good news. Uh, we are casting the semi-finals of the Collegiate Star League, and that's why we've been bumped up to the big leagues, I guess. We've bumped to the main channel, which is pretty cool. But I'm definitely, um, you know, aside from that, I'm more excited for these actual games. This is what's going to decide who we're going to meet and cast live in person at DreamHack Austin, and of course, who has an even greater chance at the grand prize of that sweet, sweet scholarship money. So, Twitter has added this new ha uh, moments feature where notifications used to be. Yeah. I'm trying to find, you know, where the CSL tweet is so I can go retweet it. But it keeps bringing the moment page and it's making me so mad. Ooh, Why wow. are they trying to make this a thing? Stop making it a thing. It's not going to uh, work. Anyways, I was hoping to ask a favor here and this is like a not a great one. Because I spilled a lot of my soup, I didn't get to eat any of it. I've been cleaning it up. Would you mind just YOLOing this first one while I eat? I do not mind. And in fact, let's just get right into it since you're already in the lobby. Okay, I'll meet myself. I'm watching though. I'm watching. Okay, okay. We'll be able to talk about it at least. Yeah, I, I don't mind. I've actually, um, I. <sighs> I actually had a really tough day, but like this is not going to be a sob story. It's just that I'm surprised at how much energy I have. I don't know. I guess because I had the vacation and before. Oh, you don't want to see that. Oh, just ignore that thing that popped up. Um, and uh, as I was saying, like I had the vacation beforehand, and then we had like all those days off, and then I come back and that Tuesday, the day I again don't cast. It feels really weird. It feels a lot more comfortable right now than it has doing no casting, okay, and, and no streaming, so I'm glad to be back. But in the top right, as the teal zerg, it is going to be Star Elf. Uh, let's check what, uh, what team he's playing. I just had it up, too. Oh, I have to get used to, to Twitter uh, not being on an application anymore, which is going to be really to be honest. Wait, why is it not on your application? That used TweetDeck. Yeah, well, TweetDeck's gonna uh, go down on April fifteenth, so I have to get used to having it on the oh. web. Welcome to being a pleb like the rest of us. Oh, it's I'm just taking so a break annoying. from muting myself from it. Say, don't worry, baby, but we miss you. We're all glad to have you back. Oh, thanks. Uh, but this uh, this guy, Star Elf, he is playing for in New York University, and in the bottom left as uh, the Yellow Terran. He's actually on flip side. It's Goki who is, of course, playing for UC Berkeley. So that is the matchup today, as you were seeing on the, the pre-screen, was UC Berkeley versus New York. That's a pretty standout matchup. I mean, of course, you know, here uh, with uh, us as casters, we have a little bit of bias towards New York. You know, I, I taught there. I taught StarCraft 2 there. That You know, that's a little bit of bias, but also we just know a lot of the players. And Call Me Steve, their coordinator, has been, like, a really great guy throughout the entire process. So they just they stick out in this as well. But UC Berkeley is... A really good team uh, all around for esports. You know, we talked a little bit last year, like Heroes of the Dorm. I don't think they were in this one, but still, uh, they've produced a couple of really good uh, players. And certainly, Goki being on flip side tactics, even though he's not like a you know a highlight player like Bale something or not Bale's. Um, although I guess Bale's is still on their team, I think. <laughs> uh, but a highlight player like some of their other team members, uh, it's it's a mark of what he has certainly talent-wise as well as probably skill-wise. So I would give this one to Berkeley right off the bat, but I guess, you know, I, I we'll see what Staroff can do. I know Staroff is definitely Masters, not sure about any higher than that. Already losing an Overlord, though, is not a great start at all. A single Reaper is causing a little bit of havoc as well. And I can certainly see why he didn't think he was going to lose an Overlord. I mean, you might question why is it there, it's not doing anything, that is absolutely correct. But there's also supposed to be no reason for it to be scared. Um, it, it could have scouted the Hellions, you know, that popped out or what have you. And oh my god, is it actually going to live? Oh my goodness! It's going to live. It takes way too long to get up in that plateau. Wow! Okay, well, that was a very intentional Marine to get an Overlord. Um, 
now it's going to be a Marine that can possibly deny scouting and should be able to deny scouting. I mean, like, run back home and, and hit the thing, like, five times, and it's going to go down. So it's it's still, like, kind of a useless overlord, but it didn't die. It didn't supply block, block them. You know, it's not 100 minerals you have to remake. It's not a larva you have to use for something that's not a drone. So I call it pretty lucky for Star Elf. Um, oh, my God. I thought I, th I, thought I saw two Star Boards. I almost had the mini, mini panic attack, but it's just two SCVs. Uh, it is Dusk Towers, so the quick layer into what I assume is going to be for a Spire makes a lot of sense. Uh, just combination, it's it's a big map with a lot of open space, could be good for me to Ling Bling. It's also that Liberators can be kind of a problem on this map as well, certainly a lot of Liberator builds are used. I mean, Liberator builds can be used anywhere, honestly, as long as they're not like fully committed. Like, no, no Bunny builds coming out, but Dusk Towers was... Definitely one of the maps where the bunny build was abused. Not that we see them that often anymore. Uh, so it just it certainly helps in the beginning. You can transfer out after, but there really isn't a point to. You know, months ago it was okay, Mutaling Blink doesn't work, not even on a big map. And I mean like, you know, months, months ago. Now it's like Mutaling Blink can kinda of work on any map, but um you would always see people transfer back into Roaches because they thought that that was the only way to play in Legacy of the Void. Nah, eh, not so much anymore. You you can go the the old standard. Now this Helen's getting in here is a little surprising. You don't really think the Helen's going to do very much, but oddly enough, this was consistent in Heart of the Swarm as well. If you only got four Hellions, uh, that sometimes is a big red flag that they're going to suicide. Uh, in Legacy of the Void, it could be even a bigger flag, especially if you don't scout a medevac with it, which, you know, they saw the Liberator right now, that they're going to suicide to the front. If you saw a medevac, then, you know, it's, it's hell, Hellion uh, drops. Or a Hellbat push, but we don't see that anymore uh, that much either. But anyway, it didn't take very much to clean up, and in fact, I, I don't even think, like, how many drones went down? Okay, five total. So the Reaper, this Liberator now, and I guess uh, the Hellion, so... Obviously, the Hellions don't help very much. You know, they, they, uh, the Liberator will always one-shot a drone. <laughs> I'm like, you know, maybe a Banshee coming in, but still. They, uh, they helped. And it looks like Goki, important to mention, is not going for a third CC. Usually kind of the default way to go for most maps, but certainly Dusk Towers, which is very like, third base friendly. And is instead going for a lot of production, as you can see here. So these medevacs are going to be attacking much sooner than, than Starlf probably expects. And he's had to deal with a Reaper that was annoying, almost losing an Overlord, and then Helen's going in, and now a Liberator that won't die, and almost kills his Queen. It's a very high possibility that he is anticipating the follow-up. Um, you know, it's it's actually really quite bad. It This is where the Spire is like, okay, well, at least I have this going for me, right? Like, I don't need those Spore Crawlers that maybe I should have had defaults, considering how popular Liberator follow-ups are. Um, but I could be okay against Liberators because of the Mutas. But not against 16 Marines that are already unloaded. If the Mutas were out catching two Medivacs, oh my god, this would be such a good thing for Star Elf. But it's not the case. They are actually going towards the natural to get a little bit of help from the Liberator, I suppose. Or back up the Liberator, like either way you want to you put it. And without those meters already on top of the Marines, they are going to do a lot of damage. The Baneling Nest has been done. I believe Speed is also just finished. But there's no Banelings made. And there's barely any Lings. And Goki is going to get a lot of damage out from this drop. Now, is it going to end the game? I mean, I suppose not. And for those of you that saw earlier, it, it is not. Um, it, well, but it certainly is a lot of damage. It's a really great start for Goki. And his macro just doesn't... It, it has to be sure not to slip behind this. Uh, Liberty getting a couple of lings. You know, that's that's really not that great. Um, it didn't have much much else going for it, though. Medivax getting out would be really good because he has a follow-up push already ready to go. Uh, this is definitely an interesting two-base push. Certainly a, a, a two-medivac drop without combat shields is uh, quite a standard two-base push, in fact. And then eventually you get combat shields and plus one, plus one. But uh, the engineering bay, I believe, was delayed. So now it's double engineering bay. Which is just, it's usually not what you usually see with the two base push. Usually it is one engineering bay, one upgrade, then the other. But that's uh, splitting hairs, I suppose. Uh, going on to creep like that, and then, oh, that last group of marines really hurt the follow up push. Now, luckily, the wooden mines are still up for Goki. But his medevac's going down, and his marines are still coming in one by one. So this should be something Star Wolf can push back. And what's really important that coming in one by one without medevac support. I don't think Goki should be able to get the fourth base, which I think is the like the the least you can get from a follow up push on t on a two uh, two bases for the Terran here is uh, should be that fourth base. 
And then it's a question of, okay, can the Zerg hold on on three bases? But that's not going to happen for Goki. And Star Elf should be feeling really good. Now, his drone count certainly needs to get up a little bit more. Uh, only at 47 and starting to get a little bit oversaturated. Needs to transfer the drones around a little bit. That's not ideal. You know, missing three from here, missing three from there. Um, but that is something that he, he should have time, like, right now to, like, maybe sneak in six, seven drones. I think he'd feel a lot more comfortable doing it if Creepers spread right here as well. That lack of vision and just you know, knowledge that I do not have creep spread uh, could make himself very paranoid. Um, another thing would be if he was actually scouting the lack of a third, which I don't think he is. This overload might have ducked in a while ago. Not sure. And it might be the case that he notices they're not, like, you know, um, sparkling, which you can see uh, on the mineral line when they're being mined. But I think he might be too busy to even notice that, so... Um, Basically, even though he's not scouted to no third base, it is appropriate for him to, you know, take this as seriously as possible because this is a big marine force. Accidentally picks up a load of marines and the banelings just absolutely wreck the marine army, but is it enough still? The 1-1 one, one upgrades, mind you, have been in effect for a long time over Star Elf's 0-0, zero, zero, but it looks like the banling hits were good enough. The mutic count, it's not getting extreme, but it is holding at 9, which is like the bare minimum basically of what can help kill like widow mines and medevacs any fewer and you're just gonna have to spend way too much time over those marines uh, any higher and well you know you just start one-shotting things and you risk the uh the counter attack which goki has not had to worry about at all this time uh this is a big problem transitioning from heart of the swarm to legacy of the void for uh zerks is that, you know, for a long time, I think one of the reasons we didn't like going to Ling Bling, besides a, a larva problem, was that mutas, you know, you know, for different reasons, they always had to defend, and uh, they couldn't be used to counterattack, liberators would be too big of a, of a counter. They weren't getting that counterattack damage done, which in Heart of the Swarm was, like, the number one threat. Okay, the mutas came out, and you know, two-base mutas was a very popular build, and you were just pinned into your base as a Terran for a long time. And if that count grew to like 20 or 30, you were like starting to get screwed, <laughs> you know? Once it got up to 40, you just the game was over no matter how you did otherwise. Uh, Legacy of the Void, not so much. Especially with Liberators. If the count really does grow to an extraordinary amount, you get like four Liberators, two to defend, two to push, something like that. And uh, one mistake will cost them all their mutas. So I actually really like that Star Elf is not committing a lot more minerals and gas to his mute account. Getting the second Carapace upgrade is certainly interesting, as well as just getting Carapace in, up in general. But it is, um, it's it's almost like, yeah, you know, <laughs> the Liberators, if they do come out, are still going to get that mass splash. And that's always going to be the scariest thing. Even if you have, like, plus three armor mutas, uh, they're still pretty light. And without that, uh, that health pool and natural armor that a Corruptor would have, which is, you know, what we usually see if Liberators are a problem. But anyway, um, he does have to be really careful. You know, I just talked about how I like he's not investing so much into the number. Uh, now starting to get like five more. I think 20, 25 at max. Because once you go into 30, I've seen like one too many games where Liberators do come out and Mutas do die. And the Zerg player who is like, oh my god, Mutaling Bling is so good now, like, why did I ever stop using this style, gets pushed back. Um, and that's, that's happened in a ton of different types of games too. So, mind you, this is a game where Goki, he kind of, I mean, he basically failed his two base push, like he didn't win him the game. Uh, and the follow-up didn't win the game, which is more important. Usually that is the GG decider. But he's not actually doing so bad. Uh, you know, Star Wolf being on such a low SCV count to defend against the two base pushes certainly contributed to that. But, uh, you know, it, it does look really wonky. His supply isn't terrible. In fact, it's an even arm and supply here. And he's mining on another two bases. It, it's very, very funky. But... Just the circumstances right here in this game has led to an okay macro game for Goki. Um, so, Star Elf, you know, he, he probably realizes this, you know, as his mutas just ran through the entire base, like, oh my god, you're only still on your first two command centers, like, this is kind of stupid. But he's got to deal with that, like, Terrans are the, um, what's the word, the, uh... Best. Uh, yeah, Terrans are the best, exactly. No, like, Terrans, they, they have, I think, always have had the most capability of pulling themselves out of a, a bad position, you know, whether it's it, it's drops in the right place or, or tanks holding on to a defensive line. So, uh, scrappy. I don't, 
That's what I, I don't think. disagree with that, but we've also seen Terran be the best at dying to massive amounts of splash damage, which with 46 Banelings finishing up, brings the grand total up to 67, and Star Elf... He's been very, very much systematically picking up a lot of the Widow Mines. He's been removing a lot of what would threaten those Banelings. There's no Siege Tanks, uh, Siege Tanks set up here for Goki. Like, those Banelings are just gonna kind of roll in and maybe win, is what it looks like right now, at least. It's a potential, but that's another game that I've seen way too often with Needle Ling Bling, uh, especially in Dusk Towers, is that they do get really overconfident. They, like, max out on Banelings, thinking, oh, I'm just gonna roll over this kid. And they might take a really good engagement, but the scrappiness of Terran you know, they, they push back, and suddenly Zerg's like, oh shit, like, I don't have any larva, I didn't go up to mutas, or uh, ultras, rather, and I'm actually kind of scared here. Now, this shouldn't be a problem for Starolf, as he's actually getting two ultras. He's even getting, you know, further upgrades, like, adrenal glands for his lings, so it, it shouldn't be a problem, but it has happened. Like, uh, the Terran comeback could be real. I, just, I feel like what I enjoy most out of Star Elf is not only does he have this one amazing force that could either win the game gloriously or defeat himself humiliatingly, it's the fact that so much of this I feel is going to come a little bit down to RNG. Like, how do these Widow Mines go off? They might be the perfect hits and kill every single Bane Link. They also might only kill one Zergling each and just be absolute garbage. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see that engagement come down soon. He's aware there's Widow Mines. That first one's not too bad. Picks off some of the Lings. Yeah. These Widow Mines do have to get some really nice shots, though, and I kind of, uh, I try to bring it up, but there's no second factory, which means no drilling claws, and, of course, just not a very steady flow of Widow Mines. Widow Mines can be okay, in fact, they can be great. If you have 16 Widow Mines, oh, yeah. they're never going yeah. to push into you, especially if you can reposition them with drilling claws. But without that, they can just roll in and kill them, and then you are without Splash. And... Actually, Goki, without any Marauders, just has really no capability of dealing with Banelings. <laughs> well, forget the Banelings for a second. Like, if that Chitinous plane completes, he's also not going to have any way to deal with the Ultralisks. I mean, that yeah. plus, that Chitinous armor, like, plating, that armor value, these Marines are going to have 3-3, three, three, and that's cool, but these Marines are also going to have Tickle Blasters. So, maybe they deal with the Baneling threat, and you're like, okay, cool. But they're definitely not going to deal with the Ultralisk threat. That much is almost for certain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I do like at a Star Elf, though, is the fact that he chose to bulk both of them up and not send, like, the Banelings in and then make Ultras and then send them in. This is all going to be hitting at the same time. Scanning to see this coming is going to be one of the scariest scans to land. Oh, kind of funny. Is it done? So this could be an anti-timing for Star Elf. But 3-3 isn't done either for Goki. There goes Fishing oh up right my now. God. That but Baneling he's... hit on the south side, oh, though, just Jesus. took up about a fourth of the Banelings. Oh my and god. I do believe Star Elf may have just thrown oh this game away. Oh my god, he might have. Now he has a bit oh. of a bank here and he has a lot of creeps for to fall back on, so Goki can never be truly comfortable. He remaxes with three ultras, which now have Clayton's plating, as well as 86 lings, and those are upgraded lings, adrenal glands, and 2 2. So they're no joke, although they would like to be Bane lings. I'm I'm not sure about this. I mean, the ultras you mentioned, Kenny Spinning, wasn't done, and as we can see now, one single ultra is yeah, barely going it. down. Had there been three or four, maybe this would look entirely different, but uh, Goki ends up losing a lot of units to this. And while that was one magnificent son-of-a-bitch engagement, it does look like Starelf has once again reclaimed control of this game. Yeah, very nicely done. GG to Starelf. Uh, and that will put um, New York, I believe. Oh, there's the... There's the overlay. Um, New York up 1-0. Uh, so to be perfectly clear and honest, because there's there's you know not really an intent to deceive you guys. You saw the bar accidentally, my bad, and then you saw the um, lack of continued endgame screen. <laughs> these these are from <laughs> replays. Yeah, right. Uh, these are from replays. Um, unfortunately, you know we didn't get the live results, but these are still like you know I don't know the spoilers. Rifkin doesn't know the spoilers, um, and it's it's still like this should be a really good best of seven. And this is interesting. I could have sworn Suppy has not played at all this season, right? He played in the preseason with the Archon mode stuff. Okay, but not the... Uh, not the I don't remember seeing season? him in the regular season. No. Yeah, that's what we'll call it. So this is really interesting to see him coming up in stage, uh, or game number two. Suppy versus Shu. I, this uh, feels to me like, did <laughs> did we get this replay from 2015? Like, yeah. I mean, th that's, that's the type of thing I'd expect. But, okay, so... Maybe it's a little bit odd seeing Suppy, maybe it's not. We'll see how he's handling things. I know that last time we cast Berkeley, we did kind of make some offhand jokes about how is he still playing StarCraft or not, what with his uh, focus on YouTube, and more importantly, schooling 
uh, having had some success in Heroes of the Door, and we really didn't know where Suppy sits, and we still don't know where Suppy sits. But at the same time, Shu is not the amazing player either that he once was. Both players have kind of, let's say, fallen from grace. Uh, for sure, yeah. Um, Shu uh, was, I guess, kind of, in my mind, along with Intense, in terms of, like, up-and-comers, like, Promise of the NA scene. Is this only going to pop out automatically? That's really annoying. Well, uh... <laughs> Do we have any? Can you put the CSL logo over that, perhaps, so it doesn't spoil for people or something? Um, no. I, I don't. I have no idea how malleable it is. So. Because that, yeah, it's connected to the uh, the bar at the bottom. It's not like two different images. So S O L. Yeah, that's really annoying. Um, that was certainly not a feature before the re recent change. <laughs> well, luckily, we don't averagely cast things on replay, so. <laughs> This shouldn't be something that affects us too much going forward, but at any rate, it is going to be game number two. Spawning here in the bottom left side of Arena, he is representing Berkeley. Ladies and gentlemen, evil genius is suppy. In the top left, for NYU, it's the purple Protoss, Shu. Ah, anyway. Shu, is this, he's the one that works at Twitch now, right? Is he? Yeah. Or... Who is it? There's a there is a clarity guy who works at Twitch. I suppose, or an ex clarity guy, excuse me. Oh, is it? I don't remember. I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember who we were actually discussing. I think he works at Twitch, and that's just kind of a cool fact to see. And he's a guy school? who's he's in school, he's playing StarCraft, he's working for Twitch. Like that's living the dream right there. Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I always thought Twitch was not anywhere near. New York, <laughs> which he has to go to. Unless he was like an intern. Um. Well, actually, Twitch doesn't require people to be. Like, uh, I mentioned to you, there's people who live here near me in the middle of nowhere, Canada, that work for Twitch. So it's uh, pretty sure not yeah. something you have to be able to go to the office necessarily to do. Yeah, I always figured, though, that those were, I guess, very specifically, like, out of main Twitch offices, because I've also, known a, you know I've also known a couple of people that had to move to get the job, so... You know what's super awkward right now, by the way? What? Not the builds, but the builds are a little bit awkward. Whoa. Suppy's currently playing on the Tespa stream, representing Berkeley over there over San Diego, at the moment <laughs> that we're casting this. Yeah, um, that is a little awkward. But it's certainly interesting to see Suppy, not once but twice now, just being brought out, like, you know, oh yeah, we have this guy, like, I guess he's... He's found enough time to get back uh, into StarCraft, but the question is, how good is he? I mean, we made a couple of jokes about his Minecraft and his girlfriend, and it's... Uh, oh, like I said, I'm remembering too. Life, but... <clears throat> Actually, we'll save this comment for after the uh, game's done, but just a small note about Shu uh, once we're finished. But anyways, uh, Shu is <laughs> perhaps not expecting Suppy to do what is looking like potentially Overlord drops. It says tentatively because there's no Evo Chamber yet, but... Uh, he's making that third queen. He's got the speed on the way. Boom. Mm. Evolution Chamber getting planted. Ooh. This is a map-specific build. You won't see this build come down on pretty much any other map. And this is something that has won many games here on Albrena. We've seen it multiple times. And I think the most disheartening part about this is not looking at it and being like, oh, well, you know, Shu made one small mistake. or it It's usually really on Suppy to mess this up for Shu to hold. Yeah, yeah. Um, Terrans have, have basically figured it out. Absolutely. Maybe a lucky wouldn't mind shots, but otherwise um, still okay with Marines walling off the natural and pulling your SEVs. For Protoss, it's a little bit more difficult. You don't have flying siege tanks to help, and you can't ever truly, like, comfortably wall off your natural because, of course, you can't lift your Nexus, <laughs> and Terrans can. So, no matter what, they have to usually deal with two attacks right. as opposed to the one. Well, I like this pylon block and attempts to stifle out the secondary attack. That is a very important aspect of this. Uh, if the pylon gets knocked down, Suppy can just flood through the front. There's really not a proper wall set off. Shu now struggling to get down some extra pylons and robos, but that takes away from any potential warp ins he could have sent to the main. If it robos is only just, uh, warp technically just finished, and uh, uh... this is the drop of doom! Did yeah. one of those very important gateways. Yeah, it's probably going to get the core as well, which means no stalkers and no sentries and I, no adepts. <laughs> I think Shu's uh, <laughs> he's been beaten before he even had a chance to play, unfortunately. Kind of looks that way. Uh, lots of probes going to go down here in a second. That main is just going to be totally ravaged. The natural is actually doing okay. There's a, some, a ton of SimCity going on. He already started to wall off, so we just added on a bunch of pylons. 
And with a force field, if that had cut the lings truly in half, he might have been doing a lot better, but even, you know, getting the queens out of the equation still takes down most of the Protoss army. The Mosher core is pretty dry on post and charges. Couple of zealots in good positions. Not doing so bad, but now the militia core goes down, and that is game. All right. Well, uh, certainly an, an oldie but a goodie. I mean, if, if seriously, like if Suppy came back for only today in both this tournament <laughs> and the uh, Tespa one, and he was like, "Bro, bro, give me like a map uh, or give me a build," because I know what map I'm going to be on, I know what race I'm going to face. Give me a build. And they were like, just do this one. Like, I have absolute faith that Suppy could learn it in, like, two hours <laughs> and be fine. Yeah. I'm not saying that's the case, but, you know, it could be. Um, the next series is going to be the 2v2. I shall change my replay to 2v2. Nice. Of course, uh, 2v2 is one of those aspects of this I really, really like, but... I don't know, we we've seen some really wonky stuff lately. Like really wonky stuff. Anyways, if you guys are big Suppy fans, make sure to go cheer them on in the StarCraft stream. Yep. And uh, wish Berkeley some luck over there as well. But so far, so good. So 2-0 for Berkeley. No, 1-1, one, one, excuse me. That's right. Yes. I got confused off that first player. 1-1. One, one. And I guess my solution to the whole replay tab problem is just to wait to get into the in-game screen. I am the greatest, smartest person. Now we're in game, and let's switch that over there. Okay, top left on Sludge City, playing for NYU. It is the pink Zerg, call me Steve, and the red Protoss, Yata Garasu. Uh, and his, or their opponents, I guess, combination of Udi. And I guess I don't know which camera you're on, so I just realized. Uh, Udi Oopsie. and Polar Bear Me. There you go. But yeah, I guess normal observing is pretty tough when I can't put my camera on zombie groups to see what she's seeing, but it's going to be that one element extra difficult when it's uh, 2v2s. So it's many people. Oh, whoopsie, I pressed the wrong button. My bad. Anyways, uh, 2v2 goes a lot of different ways. One of the things we always try to remind everybody at, though, is they do have a rule where you can't have two people intentionally on the same race on the same team. So. For example, as we see Protoss on each paired up with one Zerg and one Terran, you can't go both Protoss, you can't go both Terran. Uh, you can play random though, but it's funny because even though we've seen a lot of people try and chance out getting a double race combo with random throughout the season, we've never actually seen it happen. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't think we've ever seen a stacked team. Uh, and we've seen plenty of randoms, mind you, but no one got lucky. So in the playoffs, um, especially from the round of... Uh, 8 and on, I'm pretty sure they're on 16 too. Uh, we've actually seen a couple of teams, and that's why we see, again, this team, not utilize a Zerg in their composition for 2v2, whereas, you know, 90% of the teams were. Um, and in fact, we're even trying to get the double Zerg with the random going on. So this is one of those teams that is Protoss Terran. Uh, the Zerg strength is that it can either be your defense early or your attack early, you know, like they can six or uh, 12 pulls, my bad, I'm a heart of the swarm, they can 12 pull offensively or they can like 15 pull defensively against the other Zerg. Uh, considering there is no other Zerg though, the risk of being attacked super super early was kind of low. I mean, these could have been proxied barracks, so that's, it still happens obviously, but uh, Call Me Steve actually playing the, the greedier game, going for this hatch and you know, transferring all his drones I think is a lot better. Do still have to take this three racks reaper seriously though, even if it is not proxied. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the thing about the three racks reaper that we've seen a lot, <clears throat> reapers start getting ahead of power. The reapers suddenly fumble in power, and because you dedicate so much to just reapers, there's no real fallback for it. So I am a little bit worried about Udi devoting so much to this, but at the same time, if it if it gets those kills, it's worth it. Mm. Problem is though, I spied my little eye an oracle being made, and if you're going reapers, and if you're going for an expansion? Neither player really has a safe mineral line, Zombie Grub. Yeah. Well, you know, Polar Bear is going for a Stargate as well. Um, I don't think it's going to be finished in time to get a Phoenix out to protect either one of them, but eventually it will be able to. Uh, Actually, he did get a Mothership Core, and there is a pylon in the mineral line, so the Protoss player might be okay for the time being, but, but that Oracle goes cross instead of to the bottom, straight to the Terran base. Udi's in a lot of trouble. 
Yeah. It should it should be across, you know. There's been scouting in this game yeah, it looks for like he the is NYU. Too. Yeah, and they realize it's through Act Reaper. Now the mothership core defensively it hasn't doesn't quite have enough energy, but it is now, so the Reapers have to be careful and they're just gonna back off. The Oracle comes in, I believe it was spotted by one of the Reapers that was being rallied, so like the tiniest bit of advance notice to pull the SCVs, which helps a little bit, but you know, he has to go to his, his uh, teammate's base. Uh, that Stalker could just be ignored and he still would get a ton of kills, or you could just kill a Stalker because Oracles are cool, I guess. Oh my god. Yeah. Oracles are just phenomenal units. We also have Teal following up now with some lanes running across the map. That Oracle is out of juice. Already did her job. They took out a lot of the defensive things that would otherwise stop these lanes. So they surround the Reapers. Only a small handful are actually going to get back to the base. Oracle out of energy. Can't oh, no. kill any of the SCVs. But this command center not going to get to be finished. He's going to have to cancel or kill it. I'm not sure which, but neither are preferable in this situation. Oh, man. Yeah, that's uh, that really hurts. So those lanes did their job and more. But, you know, the, the whole tactic here for uh, Berkeley, bottom Oh, counter right Oracle, team. by the way. Oh, yeah, well, I forgot about that Stargates. Um, they killed a couple of probes. Again. It wasn't that devastating, but he is on smaller workers because it was one base opening. Uh, right now we got Panda Bear... Or, sorry, not Panda. That's a, another player. Polar Bear Me has a fairly significant probe count at 38. So he's not been hurt through yeah. this attack so far. Yeah, I wanted to note that, like, you know, I talked about the... the Zerg being kind of that attack or defend type of race. Terran can also fill that role, and that's what the Reapers were trying to do, while Polar Bear got a really significant lead in economy, you know, he went for that early gold base. Um, it it kind of worked, but, you know, so, Blue is really getting ravaged here, so Polar Bear is really going to have to start uh, carrying the team. Right, the dynamic of this is a little interesting, because you've got Teal for the bottom team, basically matching Pink when it comes to workers and income. Right now, both red, well, I guess red's recovered a little bit, but more importantly, blue doesn't have a lot of <laughs> a lot of workers going for them, nor do they have that expansion down from earlier. So as we get further into this game, if it goes to macro, it could be messy. Huh. But I actually want to draw back on last week's 2v2 to talk about the upgrades, if you recall. It looked like it was a bit of a 1v2 game for a while, as one of the Protoss players had just gone for 3-3 slowly and surely behind this, and that 3-3 took on two players at the same time. Yeah, I, I do remember that. Zealots are cool units. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I am very interested in seeing what the Protoss versus Protoss dynamic of this two v two is going to happen because we have a double Stargate Phoenix versus just one Star Stargate Phoenix. What's funny is that when we did two v two tournaments a long time ago in Heart of the Swarm, proxy Stargate into mass Stargate units and mass Phoenix most of the time <laughs> was actually super popular. It was a, a really solid way to play the game. But we haven't really seen it in Legacy of the Void in the CSL 2v2s, a lot, of, a lot because the game would just end before anyone got to Mass Phoenix, but also, you know, like Protoss or, or what have you. So seeing what is going to be an obvious Phoenix win for Yata Garasu is going to be interesting to see if it's really going to end the game, because of course... Uh, Polar Bear could, you know, he's got a couple of photon overcharges, he's got Stalkers, he's got a Terran teammate that can start littering the ground with Widow Mines, although he's making Siege Shanks right now. Um, truly, if the Phoenix player can get up to a nice amount and would triple Stargate, there should be a nice amount. Phoenixes are such a complementary unit to, to anything. Um, they can pick up those tanks and help out the Lings and Banelings. They can pick up key units such as the Immortal. They'll pick off the Mothership Core. They'll pick off Metavacs. I mean, he's going to have easily 20 plus Phoenixes. <laughs> like, Just if he loses skies, one, yeah. that's not a problem as long as he killed whatever he picked up. I mean, emphasis wise, this in the past was a really good strategy because there wasn't a lot of things to do splash damage, but with the Terran economy being so screwed, there's not going to be Liberators here to stop this. There's not going to be anything to deal with this. Yeah, and so the, the Phoenixes. Phoenixes come in. Yeah, they're picking up those tanks as predicted. I mean, even if they don't kill them, just removing them from the fight's already enough. Marine's going to fight those Roaches and Ravagers. Looks Hello. like the Zerg army isn't quite going to be enough to push through this, but these Phoenix still haven't really been dealt with. Yeah, uh, a lot of them get quite low, and I think there was like uh, one too many losses for the Phoenixes, but it really was the lack of power for the Zerg here that made this look really just not very powerful. <laughs> uh, this was a really nice tactic, and they're still going to try and make it work. The rally of Roach is coming here for Colony C, but the Phoenixes can only help out so much. The Stims and Marines are starting to tear them down. Yeah. I think behind this, uh, for 
Uh, call me Steve. Would have been nice to see a little bit more, I guess, bulk with the army. Less emphasis on things like Ravagers and more on Lings and Roaches or something like that. Because the Phoenixes were taking out the critical units in the backside. There just wasn't anything to fight the ground. Like, it was, it was, it looked like seven Ravagers. Like, it really yeah. wasn't much. Uh, coming in here once again, going to pick up the Immortal, not looking too bad. The Marines trying to focus down the Phoenix, but in doing so aren't fighting the Roaches. And this looks a little bit better for Colony Steve. His macro was strong, he's moving towards the fourth base. Maybe he was just missing that one inject, but right now this army's starting to really overpower. And that supply from Protoss, uh, Teal, uh, sorry, excuse me, pulled over me, just really plummeted. He's down to five Stalkers, two Immortals. Yeah. It was scary. Calm and Steve, I guess, you know, he went in just a little bit too early to really feel the big burst of larva, as you said, or, or something, because the follow-up looks so much better. Now that's a scary roach army that can be complemented by the Phoenixes, which um, his teammate is still making, as well as getting a third base. Uh, this is kind of the farthest we've seen the bases taken on this map. Usually the game has ended by now, and it might just end here in a, in a moment, but... Uh, this is obviously going to be a hard base to keep if there is lings running around or drops happening. Same with this one. But there's no offensive units right now um, for a Berkeley team. They don't have any presence on the other side of the map. And that that could really help. Obviously, any drop, any small counterattack would be forfeit with the Phoenixes running around. But it would be enough to pull back those Phoenixes, which are a key point in breaking them uh, on their bases, but they're actually the ones going to push out here. Uh, so they got a lot of immortals, and they got a couple of tanks, so that's where the Phoenix is coming. Just pick up all those key units, let the Zerg deal with everything else. And they are pretty, uh, they're, they're dealing with it pretty fine. Like, those Phoenix is so mean, many, like, they, load of balls in the air. They just crowd controlled everything. And of course, the big important units would be the biggest ones to be removed from the equation, so. Uh, just have the Roach Ravager army start bullying its way through 16 Roaches and 7 Ravagers. Looks like a little too much for anyone to deal with that. Terran Bio is the last real force standing with these Phoenix. The only thing limiting them now is they are kind of out of energy. Yeah, yeah, but they're still taking down those Medivacs that are popping out. And the Roaches and Ravagers trying to do the rest. They've uh, broken the Protoss on their main base. One Immortal doing a little bit of work here, especially against those Roaches. And a big warp in too, but call me Steve. He's rallying. We have his teammate taking a gold. Oh, this is a gold base? Okay, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> never pay attention before. There's a lot of gold bases on this map. Uh, they they have one. The momentum is just a little bit too strong. And these Phoenixes could just leave and, and regain the energy without you know, dying. There they go. Uh, I guess we kind of neglected to talk about upgrades, but Call Me Steve also on some pretty good ones. 1-1-1. One, one, one. <laughs> a little bit interesting. But everything on the ground for him is effective. Even plus one air for the Phoenixes. Uh, here's where they would really like to pick up those Immortals, or maybe even the Adepts, considering how many Lings there are. There they go, picking up something. It's uh, really just starting to go too much One Direction at this point. And uh, I don't mean a wonderful boy band. just mean in the favor of the players. So for NYU, a good a good lead going to be getting back in their favors. They did start the series 1-0, Subby brought it back 1-1, and now we have that 2-1 lead for NYU. Very nice. I gotta tell you, I'd be very, I've got no bias against Berkeley. We just, I feel like, not only has NYU been really fantastic in regards to watching players play, but they've also been always, almost always, you see Steve, if not someone else, like in Twitch chat for all the CSL matches, and they've been really invested in this tournament. So for them, really nice to see a lead. And I'm hoping to see this extend even further. They would be, they would be a great set of people to meet over at the uh, Dreamhack Austin finals. I feel like, you know, maybe Call Me Steve noticed, or maybe they're just you know, like a good bunch of people by default. But they're also that team that, like, you know, if I said Archon mode say here, they would actually say here, <laughs> which <laughs> gets a lot of brownie points in my book. I mean, it sounds silly, but for those who don't know, the, uh, the the struggles of working with amateurs has been rather profound. And yeah. I've got nothing I've got nothing particularly rude to say about any one player or anything like that. It's just just this culmination of people not being ready to go. When you've got a team that is actually dedicated and prepared and ready, it really does stand out. And the we'll call it professionalism, I guess, of NYU has been great this whole season. Mm -hmm. Again, this is no shots fired at anyone else. They've just really stood above the rest. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going into game number four. This is the Archon mode match. It's going to be on Orbital Shipyard. In the top right for NYU, it is the Pinkzerg Archon of Grass Cutter and Calm Steve. And in the bottom left, we're going to have. We already saw once today Goki come out and play against uh, their opponents with Secure Chio. Hmm. Yeah, uh, this does look. 
familiar for at least the NYU team. Not uh, too much fresh in my mind for Berkeley uh, about who their 2v2 team is. But certainly Call Me Seed has always been the Archon 2v2 guy. Well, I wish I could remember, uh, again, for those who don't know, so this isn't lack of... Uh compassion or they like, we just cast so much stuff in between the CSL games. I wish I could remember because Goki, I think, wasn't he the guy who played that rematch with Shrek in the Archon mode in the previous one or am I thinking of a different player? The rematch in the Archon mode of Shrek. -y. I think I know what you're talking about and it does sound familiar. Couldn't confirm though. Okay, well if it's the same situation that I'm thinking of, uh, Goki certainly showing he can play twice. There's no doubt about it, but uh, we'll see how this actually goes. One of the weird things that we, we learned recently, especially in the round of eight going into this, how deadly a no-show can be, especially when your roster is very mm -hmm. tight-knit, you've used up all your good players in the situations already. It's very important that you know, we don't know which players are left on the roster necessarily. We don't know who's showing up this week versus not showing up this week, but planning ahead became very apparent to us in last week's round of eight when it came to the CSL. And I am curious, like, what players are being purposely reserved. Like, this has been a definite concern we brought up with what seems like Archon mode more than even the 2v2, where this ends up being a bit of a throwaway match. You'll stack a bad player with a good player and just say the good player hopefully carries in a lot of these instances. Yeah. Now, I'm not calling anyone here bad, but that's what I'm asking. Like, is this going to be the situation? Did they put Goki out again now because they know he couldn't possibly play the ace match? Or what is the choice there? Is he just an amazing Archon mode player? We don't know. You know, those kind of extra strategies actually come into effect here. Yeah. Actually, like, last week was a real bummer for, um... I can't remember the... Uh, Toronto, wasn't it? Because I remember, like, you were disappointed. I, I believe it was Toronto, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm disappointed to be Canadian right now. Um, yeah, did not have a player show. And, you know, this was uh, a problem. They had to have a sub in that, you know, wasn't ever going to win, basically. And it was a little unfortunate. But just speaking of that, uh, we did get a, a tweet here from Call Me Steve, again, a guy that's been really active with the cast and whatnot, that Shu apparently had to travel to California and played his game in a CD internet cafe. Now, mind you, Shu is the, the guy that lost here. He lost against Stop Shu the lost, too. I think, a lot more to strategy. Than, well, yeah, uh... yeah, I'm not saying that's why he <laughs> lost, but I'm saying he showed up. Like, okay, so that was at least a better than zero chance of having to be like, oh, well, I guess that's a forfeit. Let's go on to the 2v2. Yeah. So kudos to him for at least trying. Uh, but any anyway, um, I do have a very standard TVZ right now. Uh, you know, we'll highlight the differences that Archon and 1v1 can can make later when we actually have a couple of units really being used. Maybe the handling controls a little bit better or something like that. But right now it is just standard and the micro player is probably feeling a little bit bored uh, for both teams. But um, at least they got a Reaper. It's denying a third for a while. You know, I'll, I'll just comment on that too while we're uh, get things sort of heating up. Still nothing really definitive going down. One of the things I really wish we would have Blizzard do is uh, Archon mode is a fantastic matchup, but it's honestly thrown a bit to the side by everybody, not just, uh, you know, maybe college kids, but also the pros who dedicate to this game, their lives. Like, no one really sees this as serious forms of competition, and I only see this as, like, one of the coolest opportunities to play. So I would hope that moving forward with StarCraft at some point, we start seeing better indicators of, like, who's doing what. We're always guessing, is there even a micro player versus a macro player? Maybe they're both actually doing everything like DeMuzzle and Major described in their games, you know? Mm -hmm. It's such a shame, because Archon Mode could be such a just glorious thing. Yeah. So we have a little bit of action as those lings are kited and the Hellings just run on through. We saw this earlier today. The Hellings didn't do so much damage and the Zerg player still ended up winning. The splits have to be pretty good here though. So three Hellings will still do a lot of damage if you line up your drones. The Queen's the only thing poking at them because they just simply didn't have any more lings. And seriously, like even if you have two lings on the backside of these Hellions, it does make it a lot harder for the Terran player to get those shots. But there is some good last minute splitting for the drones. So the drone kill count is a solid eight. That's pretty good for four Hellions. Yo, it's not. A, oh, I'm like jaded. It's like all right for Archon mode. You would expect more, obviously, but uh, eight's a decent trade at least. So it's not the end of the world. Liberator is going to be kind of interesting to see. Uh, Spire is going to be coming out though. So even if there wasn't a spore caller here, so there is. They're ready to go. They're going to be able to prepare against this. I was going to say though, uh, the Spire should be more than enough. Yeah. Too many times do we find ourselves in even, like, the best of Korean matches, tugging our hair out, just going, like, why no Spire? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so playing pretty similar to their first player of the day on Dusk Towers, Star Elf here. Uh, Mila Ling Bling versus, not a two-base Terran this time, it is a three-base Terran, but still, you know, a bio Terran, obviously. Not a lot of mech players in the CSL, though we got to see a few. Um, 
I guess while we wait for this drop to commence, another situation of if they hit before the mutas, then 60 marines are going to have a tough time being dealt with, but if they hit while the mutas are out, then hopefully the mutas could have could have sniped this. The um, Archon mode score for both of these teams does favor Berkeley. They have been the uh, historically stronger Archon team, and uh, they're looking okay here. I mean, they got those Hellion kills, and this is apparently going to do more damage than really... <laughs> um, desired by the New York team. Their banelings were not done despite getting a very early baneling nest, and with only five, those could actually be targeted, especially if the Liberator has anything to say about it. Uh, we'll just try and get the Queen, so the instant pick up here. Not a bad defense, but you can start to see where the macro player, probably, of the uh, Zerg is starting to fall a little bit behind. Only on 44 drones on three bases, not really getting a ton of Mutalisk. I guess there's a... Uh, wait, there's a, not a lot of a problem. Could add one or two more, but there we go, there we go. Uh, the cleanup happens on the double marines, though, uh, double medevacs, so that was a mess up of the Terran Micer. Yeah, actually, that's kind of, hmm, a better way to describe Archon mode in some instances, too. It's not about the new new heights you can reach together as a team, but more about the less mistakes you're supposed to be making together. So, micro instances like that shouldn't happen too much. Third base, though, in a bit of trouble. That spine is going to hold up for a little bit longer. These Widow Mines going to deal with those lings. Mm -hmm. Pop, pop. I was originally questioning the spine crawler. I think it was made in the main and then transferred over to the third, but it's it's helped uh, quite a little bit here. And the supplies have certainly been evening up as the drops from the Terran player have not really been working. Um, so as long as they live, it doesn't matter if they really do a lot of damage, but you know, if they live, then I think it's it's always great. But the fact that they are dying could have been a problem. But more importantly, a bigger problem is for the Zerg still, who are still not at a good drone count, trying to get a fourth base, trying to break down their rocks. They're not even really utilize this fourth base, except for maybe some larva, but certainly not for uh, actual mining with such limited drone count. Trying to open the rocks up for possible expansion. One thing we get a little bit worried about here for NYU, they don't really have, I'll say, good upgrades on the way. Like, they have upgrades coming, mm. it's, but it's like in terms of speed and plus one for the Mutalisks. Don't think that's really going to play off yeah. too well against the 1 1 Marines. I guess uh, Sakura Chio and Goki don't really have a lot of upgrades themselves, but I mean, it is better standing for them. 1 1 finally starts up for the NYU Zerg team. Yeah. Uh, the macro of the Terran team is just starting to really surpass that of the Zerg. Uh, again, still not at the ideal drone counts. Now the question of the fourth being denied is starting to become a problem. And as you said, those upgrades were started quite late. I mean, they were going to be later because of the opener. You know, getting that speed first as well as the mutas. But uh, they're still pretty late. Uh, spine Cloud is sniped and then leave. <laughs> Back into those wood of mines, which don't get the greatest hits, so... It's so a nice splitting from the micro player on the Zerg front. But it is the, the macro game right now, and they are definitely losing it at half the army supply. They would have to hope for some killer baneling hits to make up for that. No overseer, please. <laughs> it's just like awkwardly sitting there like... Mm. Mm. Scan goes to the third base, seeing what the army looks like, how big the army is, and with this entire Terran army, including some Liberators in your arsenal now, I think that should just be not quite stim and win, but yeah, push and do a really good job. <laughs> you know, maybe not bulk up your, your Widow Mines like that, but uh, still, this is looking pretty good. Maybe a couple Marauders could be included on the front line to soak the banding it's initially, but honestly, the Widow Mines can do that too if they're lined up against the wall. They are clumped up, that's where a couple of banelings probably would ideally be sacrificed, but there's not actually a lot of banelings to sacrifice. There's not a lot of lings turn into banelings. Oh, this is so worrisome though. That army supply from Terrans is growing a little too big, and Goki, Sakura Chio, <laughs> unless they take the worst banelings hits of their lives, this is going to be, I think, maybe one of those death blows. They do get hit pretty hard, but there's so many more marines where that came from. Yeah. Aha, uh, they might just be cleaned up? No, actually, with good enough splits, the last amount of banelings are not going to be able to take everything out, so the mutas all die, queen dies too, and that's going to be game, and an even score once again in this best of seven. Yeah, it's uh, a little bit awkward, but, I mean, <laughs> the last couple of banelings trying to hatch out are just going to get picked up by even the liberators. Yep. Uh, I guess just sticking in it. it it's... <laughs> 
This is really a do or die time. No one wants to lose a game, even though they have three other games to fall back on. Three other teammates, or four other teammates, depending, I suppose. Um, to fall back on, it's, uh, it's a case where this could be your last game of the season, you know, for Call Me Steve, who definitely can't come out as ace, for instance. And doesn't want to give up too easily, but this is certainly game. You're on two bases against three. You know the Zerg player? Nope. Nope. GG. Well, there you go. Ties it up now. Two to two for Berkeley and NYU. Well, uh, we got uh, Steve and Goki in chat, by the way, just kind of discussing with one another. I didn't see this now, but apparently they had uh, just prepared for three racks Reaper, and I don't blame them <laughs> either. That was Orbital Shipyard, for goodness sake. It's our combo, for goodness sake. Like, you put me in that situation, and I'm begging you for Reapers every single time. That is that is an excellent point, Orbital Shipyard. Uh, the older map pool, if you guys haven't noticed, we've been playing on the old map pool, and that was certainly a problem. One that they were actually going to try and fix without replacing Orbital, and then it's really like, eh. Whatever. <laughs> Let's just get a new map in there. But the next games are now all going to be 1v1, even if it goes to the ace match. Uh, they're still all presets on the maps and presets as the, um, you know, who you're going to fight. You know you're going to fight. And the next match is going to be a TVZ with actually one of, uh, at least my favorites for New York, MVP versus Silky. And here in the top left is Silky <laughs> for Berkeley. I was like, w was that the intro? I was like... <laughs> but uh, it's funny opposite in the bottom right side of Fran Terraces, we've got the Green Terran MVP. Now again, every time we cast this, there's that disclaimer necessary. This is not the Korean MVP. Many of you may have come to love over the times of StarCraft 2. This is just simply a player who uses the name. Yeah. He certainly has uh, some potential, though, as a Terran player. His macro's been pretty good, his micro's been pretty solid, uh, has some pretty good builds, but um, it is it is just like the case of, like, he is a so all-around solid good player, good one to have on your on your back, you know, like game 5 or game 6, like it is right now, that you can fall back on. As long as you guys haven't been 4 would then you're, you're pretty sure he's going to get a game, which is, you know, obviously important. There's actually, like, some pretty significant... Um, strategy that you can research into when it comes to like other sports to try and mimic that when it comes to StarCraft 2 like who are your tail ends to a best of seven or a best of five who do you start out with what type of player do you start out with but I don't know if anyone's really been you know too invested into that I feel like Call Me Steve would be with how committed he's been as a, as a coordinator but I, I don't know <laughs> Uh, a lot of these teams, uh, especially the ones that were before the round of 16, did just have kind of like, okay, we have a couple of good players, let's throw them out. Um, but then the other players were not able to support. And that's why it is a best of seven in such a fashion, is that you want to not just have a team that has Intense and Xenocider and Bales, and that's why they win. In this case, Silky and Bales. Or Silky and... Shoo. And yeah, actually, if I remember, wasn't it? It was Silky and Suppy playing the Archon mode in the preseason, actually. Just thinking back on it. Since Sounds we're just familiar. Yeah. Naming off pairs of folks here real quick. So, again, we may not have seen Suppy a lot, but he won his one match, and <laughs> maybe he'll bring him back for the ace. I don't know. Uh, I guess it's kind of funny. I didn't really consider... Every time we talk about the CSL, it's usually focused on the schools or the players, but this actually does have like this aspect of both players are on fairly notable teams. Uh, Team Ascension obviously not nearly as glorious as Flipside Tactics, but both are very important and both have been around for a while in North America. Yeah. Uh, Team Ascension around for a lot longer, I believe. Flipside Tactics is kind of like the... Um, I don't know what, it, what a good analogy is, but basically, like, you know, originally these a lot of these guys and a lot of the production or uh, behind-the-scenes team was from Clarity, and then they were on uh, a second team, which is now defunct... Uh, which I forget the name of it was, and, and now no, just I thought the team name was Defunct. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, I, I just can't remember the name of it. Um, but now a lot of them are back on the flip side tactics. You know, a couple of them have graduated on to bigger and better things like MYI and whatnot. But it's just whenever I see flip side tactics, I'm like, oh, like Clarity guys, <laughs> without the mm. uh, um, the head honcho who has since been like long gone from Starcraft. Pretty sure, what's his name? I'm a, I'm a good rememberer today. 
Uh, Ovo does go down, but it did at least get a little bit of a scout. See what it did see. So I'll tech lab on a factory with a later starport that's not right next to the factory. Um, this tiny little thing can tell you the difference between it being a banshee build and a tank drop build, which is a tank drop. Yeah, tank drop is actually, <laughs> speaking of which, something I would have expected to see in Archon mode more than anything else. But uh, while the actual aspect of dropping and focusing on the drop can certainly be a problem, Oh, uh, can you just leave it at the front? Sorry. Package. Let me get in my window. <laughs> um, I got that 360 degree camera, by the way. Ooh. So, oh. kind of expensive, but we'll play with that at DreamHack a bit. Uh, at any rate, what was I saying here? Take drops. Right, so a really important part of the match, and especially for you terraces, where if not flooding legs with the extra gold minerals, usually an overinvestment in roaches. So I think tanks are in general a good idea. Having a couple of medevacs maneuver them around is absolutely what you want. But I'm really glad that this isn't actually a focus on tank drops because if it was for harassment's sake, that's too much effort you have to put in for too little return. Mm, I agree. Uh, the widow, or sorry, the marine drop without a widow mine. It had like one space open. It fooled me. Uh, and the marine drop does have a lot of power even without stim because it is such an early part of the game. And in fact, we have our zerg player Silky trying to transition a little bit into roaches, which he's done now, and this should have just been picked up immediately. But uh, you know, it, it could have been a, a case of marines with a medevac, even without stim, can take on one or two roaches at a time for sure. But uh, just enough here. I gotta go grab this. This is a really expensive package. I don't want to leave it outside. I'm sorry. I'll be right back. Uh, so yeah, the tank was just used defensively, and it would be wise of MVP to continue making tanks, to be honest, because now he's confirmed that it is roaches. The thing about Preon Terrace is that it's almost always roaches. It's like a very, very safe bet if you have zero scouting that they're going to do a 1-1 one, one roach push. Um, if not that, then just roaches in general, which is what we're seeing. You know, he's going to have a very quick infestation pit, but still roaches in general. And in general, you want to have tanks against that, not widow mines or um, hellbats, I guess, <laughs> the other option from the factory, and, and certainly not Thor's. But it's not the only composition. Mass bio does well against it as well, but usually only when you have a high medevac count and decent upgrades. So that's where like things get a little bit scary. Um, if you are going to play like that, then drops are certainly a necessity, and they are just not only a necessity, but they're just, you know, it's a really freaking good idea. They're going to have stim soon. Uh, very, very soon they can pick up this drop. And so you, what's going to be more important is if MVP scouts an invitation pit so he knows he's going to be worried about being attacked. Okay, go. So you wonder where this gets a little bit awkward? I don't know if I should offer this guy help. He's sitting at the end of my driveway. It looks like he's looking at his engine like his car broke. <laughs> I just got to run outside my underwear and grab the package and ran back inside. <laughs> I don't want human interaction. Bye-bye. Yeah. Pretty much. Yo, yesterday, um, this old guy, okay, and, and thankfully it was like a innocent looking old guy, okay, <laughs> like someone's grandpa, he just like pulled over in a right-hand turn lane, you know, not like into a residential area um, on a busy street because I was walking slash jogging and just waited for me at the end of the street. So a good five minutes for me to walk back, you know, over to him. And then he asked me where uh, a, a nearby high school was. And I was like, man, <laughs> That's a little uncomfortable. it's like in the nighttime and who would just stop in the middle like this and just wait for me. That was a little weird, but... Yeah, uh, just a bit. Uh, you, didn't look like, you didn't look that crazy. Oh my god. When we were leaving the, um, the hospital, I was being driven by my brother and my sister-in-law. Uh, <laughs> we passed by this guy, and my brother had the most terrible things to say about him. I felt so bad. Like, luckily the guy couldn't hear, but basically he looked like a serial murderer, and, uh, pretty sure he's gonna go steal blood or something from the hospital. Oh, wow. So you're bringing this up with me because... I mean, you know, no reason. Just, you know, just be careful. Is this the, uh... Are you afraid of a serial murderer or a vampire? Vampire. <laughs> No, 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 <laughs> vampire. You know, you you just you just suck them dry. You don't you don't kill them. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Phrasing. Whoa, 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 whoa! Phrasing. <laughs> anyway. <Tommy Grub. laughs> uh, okay, so I mentioned that a very important part of this game was going to be scouting what type of roach game it was. Now, simply by the lack of an attack, you can tell that they're not going for a one-one roach push because it's 
past that time already. Um, but you would have liked to have scout uh, the Infestation Pit as a Terran, which I don't believe he ever did. The, the, the drops tried, but they just couldn't get past you know, Queen Defense and uh, what are now Fungals. So they push into an army that was well prepared with a really good concave. The tanks are fungal, it can't be lifted. Luckily the medevacs get out, and it's a pretty hefty medevac count, but I just feel like MVP was very caught off guard by... Well, first of all, army positioning. He definitely didn't want the tanks out in the open like that, but also yeah. just uh, composition. Like, I don't see many marauders here. Not that marauders are, again, the end-all be-all, but it just wasn't a big enough army with good enough upgrades to take on roaches you know it's a very it's a it's a pretty well planned well set composition and uh well mvp just doesn't have it and his tanks are all gone and this is wow. some brute force out of yeah. selkie and i mean this is really just falling apart i thought you know, well he had about seven or six tanks on the field any sort of engagement would have been good but roaches and ravagers you've got a gold base map to work with he's got four bases silky made this map work to his advantage in every way a zerg possibly could Mm -hmm. And this is uh, this is spelling doom. There's some medevacs in play. Maybe we see a fungal growth or not. I don't know. <laughs> There's just so many ravages on the ground. I don't feel like yeah. you could possibly kill them with the firepower that's here. Yeah. And this is the probably the worst we've seen MVP lose. You know, like I was saying MVP. earlier, he's usually a very solid, you know, good all-around player. But yeah, maybe the map combined with the uh, the, the composition was just too much for him. He got kind of kind of stomped there. So now it's Berkeley with the three-two lead. This could be the last game. Yeah, uh, being a best of seven, this will go to four, whichever team gets the four first wins. And if that's going to be the case, then Berkeley is going to go to those finals. And maybe we'll get to see Soppy or meet Silky. I don't know, but uh, it's not looking good for NYU. Oh. I feel a little bit bad cheering them on early. Maybe I did some, some preemptive cast or cursing. Preemptive, <laughs> or you know, post replays. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. All right, well, let's get into potentially last game. It's going to be on Lairlac Crest. And we're going to have a couple of familiar names, Grasscutter and Sakurachio. Okay. Make sure you don't see what time it is. And let's get that score up. Uh, yes, that's what it's going to be. In the bottom right, his team is down one. All hopes lie on him. It is the Pink Zerg Grasscutter. And... Funny opposite. Sorry, I had my camera reversed. Uh, in the top right is going to be the Terran Sakura Chio. Now, of course, it was Sakura with Goki that did manage to win the Archon mode match. So maybe carried by Goki or maybe carried Goki. We'll find out here mm. in this match. Yeah, we will. Uh, so Lairlac Crest, again, one of the older maps. It's not in the new map pool. So these positions, actually, like really any positions, let's be honest, in Lairlac Crest. I feel like, I've always felt like a Terran does have an advantage. Um, cross position was a little bit questionable because it does put you in a wide open area, but the two, uh, two base tank pushes on horizontal or vertical are just, they're very strong and they're pretty abusive. They have a couple of ledges they can use and just, you know, that short rush distance. Very, very often we'd see a Roach Ravager push versus a two base tank push and the two base tank push um, would almost always win, you know, controlled properly. But towards the end of this map's life, which is about a couple weeks ago, it, it died. <laughs> we did see a lot of Zerg, surprisingly, just start going for two base Spire into Mutilane Bling, which I always... It wasn't the worst map for it. I, I hate when Zerg players go for that on Arena. I still don't know why some do it. But there, that crest like, wasn't so bad. Um, but it, it is going to be up to Grasscutter to decide here. He just saw his teammate fall to a very powerful Roach Ravager composition, but that was off the back, off of, uh, off the back of two gold bases, so... Very different, uh, like, timings on, on when you're going to push, how strong your push is going to be, uh, you know, with a regular old no-gold base map. Yeah, I, I mean, this map, uh, I guess it's been a while. I guess it's kind of fun to consider. We're so used to the new map, well, it's been a while since we've seen Lairlac. But one of the things I often remember and always want to emphasize, is especially in these spawn locations, how much of a pain it is going to be expanding. So, I mean, it's not gold bases and you're going to maybe struggle with thirds usually not it's fourths that become questionable most of the time but uh, i think definitely spawn locations do favor grass cutter here ever so slightly especially oh. when we're going later in the game but right now the reaper getting some nasty shots in yeah uh some pretty good grenades going down here already have the two kills is really nice uh considering that 
The Zerg player really wants zero kills. Uh, so not just like zero drone kills, which is pretty big that they're both drones, but also zero lane kills. Um, certainly as a, as a Terran player, whenever I have one Reaper, I'm, I'm mostly content with getting like four lings. I'm like, good job Reaper, and I send him back home. <laughs> or a way to scout later, but... Uh, two drones, nice start for Sakura Chiyo. He's got the starport on the way, which makes a lot of sense, but not the tanks. Uh, you start that tank count early, you can get a very high tank count. Uh, maybe start off with a Woodamine drop first, which is certainly, uh, I think, everyone's favored go-to into tank build. But we actually have Hellions, um, followed by, it looks like Banshees, to be honest, because of the proximity of the barracks and the starports, uh, and two gases. But he also could just, you know, start stim and go for, like, a Liberator. Okay. This would be deceiving to a, an Overlord Scout, but this Overlord Scout has speed, so even if he was, like, aware of the possibility of a fake, you just go in, like, two seconds later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're too fast. Like, one or two Marines isn't gonna stop this. Too fast, too furious. Yeah, Overlords. Too fast, too furious. You know, episode six. Actually, I wonder, so... The guys who play the CSL, right? Uh, they're going to go to Dream Manic Austin. They're going to get a chance to play in the CSL finals. Are they allowed to play in the open bracket, too? <laughs> Is there going to be any restrictions on that? I hope so. Like, I really hope they do uh, time that out well, because I think a lot of people would love it, you know? Get the chance really to go, cool, yeah. and then on top of that, actually participate in the tournament. One that is not dominated by Koreans, and probably not Europeans, too, because Tor, uh, uh, the Dream Act Tour is, is right after. No, actually, I'm wondering, is it called DreamHack France or DreamHack Tours? I actually don't know. I heard something that may have been different earlier today, and I realized I actually have no idea. I thought it was DreamHack Tour, and you don't pronounce the S, but I don't know. <laughs> DreamHack France is just, it's its a cop-out, I feel, for not being able to pronounce Tour correctly. <laughs> okay. There's always that, yeah. Just like, uh, you know, DreamHack, um... Oh, man, what was the, what was the really... No one ever pronounces the dream hack. Uh, oh crap! Oh, Les Lazy Pig. Yes, exactly. Like Lazy Pig. <laughs> lazy Pig, Lesbian Pig, whatever you want to call it. Uh, now, Spine Guard is being set up, and I actually rather enjoy this choice. But unfortunately, as we see, it's quite the army coming from Terran. Uh, the Liberator sets up pretty nicely. There's nothing really shoot it other than this Queen on the side, so it is slowly getting chipped away. The Lings however, get absolutely demolished anytime they want to come in and try and contest these Hellbats. Chio, Sakura, sorry, uh, really doesn't have anything to push past the spine, so I ended up chasing back home. The wall finished up just barely. I want to find out how clutch that SCV was at getting this down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Liberator did survive, and even though that push was meant to do more damage, it still did the, the indirect damage. You know, the spine claws were made, the lings were killed, the drones weren't made, although being made now, and the spine, the spire was also really a little bit too, so he doesn't have to worry as much about getting this cancelled, you know, by surprise by mutas. So, Sakuji is still in a good position. Uh, it is definitely surprising. I think that the surprise factor was certainly his his, um, his reasoning here to see a Hellbat push, both in general and on Lairlat Crest. Because in general, Zergs are still getting roaches, even though they're not going for like pure roach compositions. They're at least getting that roach worn initially, which mm. is why I've personally given up on my Hellbat pushes. Like, I've just pushed into too many roaches too many times. But he's still continuing here. Those Hellions transform back into Hellbats to break down the rocks. Um, eventually I mean, going to just be giving a favor to the Zerg, but, you know, right now it's a little bit scary. Well, it's kind of cool, because this actually ends up tearing down... Like, the Liberator set up this nice choke off on that ramp, so first off, nothing can really run away, but nothing come here to reinforce either. A, a Spore Crawler is going to finish up, and funny enough, it's actually going to finish before the rocks are burnt down. Burnt down? I guess I just said uh. that, but uh, <laughs> they are being burned away by the Hellbats. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, certainly an excellent point about the Liberators uh, choking off the uh, the drone reinforcements, or transferred, rather. But the spine crawlers could not be targeted, so that was a smart move by Grasscutter. Now, I'm looking at the macro here, and it's worrying. Um, Grasscutter and Call Me Steve had the same problem in their Archon mode match, and it's affecting him now here. Unable to spend his mineral bank, not looking so hot on the overall supply. This push, which is a little bit bare to be honest, you know, Banelings in appropriate number would have been able to take care of it, is actually just steamrolling Grasscutter, who was not prepared. Oh no, the drones. Oh dear. This is kind of cool though. I love this Evo Chamber attempt to wall off. Like, 
Okay, it's not going well, but these are really cool tactics being taken here out of Grass Cutter. And even though Grass Cutter's in a bit of a rough spot, I give him thumbs up on these tactics. Mm hmm. But this kind of looks like game. Um, you know, Grass Cutter had an okay defense against the earlier Hellbats, but then just faltered with the macro keeping up with it, I suppose, and is probably going to lose. And that is going to be a win for Berkeley if that's the case. His last ditch effort is going to be a counterattack with the Mutas, but only it's six turrets. and a Missile Turret's up. Yeah. Uh, really well handled by Secure Cheers. So the question was, you know, was this going to go in the favor of Berkeley or not? And, I mean, kind of looking like it. Yeah, it does. Uh, quite unfortunate for New York, who uh, certainly is... Uh, yeah, I've actually already met a couple of the guys. I was looking forward to see again. But uh, we're going to be able to see uh, Berkeley versus the winner of the next series coming up next. So we are casting both semifinals today. The next map is going to be Temple versus uh, Arlington. Uh, this match not quite done, but I just can't see a way for Grass Cutter to come back. Yeah, a little too far gone. I thought he, I thought he did hold really well initially. He had the good moves to build static defense against the Liberators and not actually try and throw units or queens away into it. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is just kind of uh, a bit too far gone. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that Sakura Chiyo was on uh, one once entire time for upgrade list game, but GG, congratulations to Berkeley. We'll see you at DreamHack Austin. I'm sorry to New York, who got really, really close, had a great showing, and obviously had a 4 2 score, is, is, did not do bad in the semifinals, but just could not get the win. Uh, with that, uh, do you need a, a break? Go to the bathroom. No, I'm I'm okay. Gucci whenever you're good. I I mean I'll take a break. <laughs> okay, well I just you know let's see. We don't have to wait for anyone. We have to wait for the team to show up because this is also going to be from replay. So we'll just hop right into it. Uh, like I said, it is going to be between Temple and Arlington. I was pretty impressed with Arlington. That, that name sticks out for me. Uh, they do have the much much better score. You know, between New York and Berkeley, it was a six-one score versus a five-one. So Berkeley with the better score did end up taking the win. But, you know, so that's a very close one. It could have gone either way. However, Temple with a 3-3 score and Arlington with a 6-1 score. Arlington, I would certainly say, is the, like, um, uh, or rather, uh, Temple is the underdog. Arlington should be the, not quite shoe in to win, but pretty good. Before we jump into it, though, could you do me a favor? Yes. There's, a, there's an out-of-game screen that shows the full roster of players, right? 